what is required for a baby to develop optimally? Let's like reverse engineer what's an optimal prenatal diet from that standpoint and then see where we end up. What are the top foods to eat for a healthy pregnancy? Yeah, arguably you could make the case for eating just about everything in pregnancy. Anything that is uh, rich in micronutrients, rich in protein usually gets my, my top pick. Um, so while you can make the case for anything, I think you should focus on emphasizing some specific foods. Interestingly, a lot of foods that are of animal origin tend to be the most nutrient dense. And that's not just my opinion. There's been a whole bunch of research looking at which are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. And pretty much with the exception of leafy green vegetables, animal foods take the cake. So we're talking all kinds of meat, including the organs, um, all parts of the animal, really. So cooking meat on the bone, and then using the bones to make bone broth tends to be highly nutrient dense. Um, eggs with the yolk specifically, um, fatty fish and seafood for those omega-3 fats and a number of other micronutrients like iodine, for example. Um, those are some of the, the top ones that come to mind. I love it. With regard to protein, I mean, there's, there's a lot there that I would love to unpack, but I saw some really startling statistics that you shared on your on your social media that 40% of second trimester mothers and 67% of third trimester mothers fall below optimal protein intake levels. Yes. So there's been some new research, uh, new as of 2015. We had our first ever study that directly measured protein requirements in pregnant women. Just let that sink in for a minute. That wow. was 2015. Um, this is like eight years ago. Yeah, so very recently, and our guidelines have still not been updated, just to you know level set here. Um, so that study, the one that I'm talking about with the uh, you know 40% and 67% not hitting protein targets, they were looking at how many are meeting the current RDA benchmark and how many are meeting that optimal level set by that study. So when they're talking about falling behind, it's that optimal level that they're falling behind on. Almost everybody's hitting the RDA because hmm. the RDA is extremely, extremely low. Um, it's a significant underestimate of how much protein you actually need for both your body and for growing a healthy baby. So when you look at that um, 2015 study, I mean, the, the RDA underestimates protein requirements in late pregnancy by 73%. Whoa. Way, way off. It's not like 5% off. It's way off. So. That's startling. Yeah. So why... Why do you think that? It, why, why is it that women tend to under eat protein? Is it, do you think it's, a, it's a, the result of misinformation online? A lot, there are a lot of people in our space that argue seemingly around the clock that we, we're eating too much protein as it is. Right. Um, is it, a, is it a, the result of the food environment, you know, broader socioeconomic issues? I mean, it's a couple of things. For one, because the RDA is set at a very low level of protein intake. I mean, we're just talking about enough to prevent you from dying. You know right, what I mean? Right. It's it's 10% of calories from protein when you look at the RDA. It's really low. Hmm. So like an adult woman, the RDA is 40, I believe it's 46 grams of protein. Wow. Yeah. So the RDA is 10% of calories. Yes. Damn. Yes. Even though we have separate sets of protein recommendations, the, the AMDR, Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Range, just getting into some nitpicky dietetic stuff. But that says you can eat anywhere from 10 to 35% of your diet from calories, um, from 10 to 35% of your calories from protein, and that's enough, that's sufficient. But the RDA is set at around 10%. So this optimal level still falls in that AMDR range, but more so like we're talking minimum like 18 to 20 percent of calories from protein wow um so i think there's misinformation on how much protein we actually need and there's i don't know how many protein researchers out there have been writing about this for decades and it's like why are our guidelines still behind um and then i think the big push towards reducing our intake of animal foods for a variety of reasons whether they're citing health reasons the environment or or other things and that's for another person to pick apart the nuances on um, and then I think also just our decades long anti-saturated fat, anti-cholesterol movement has naturally made people move away from eating our richest sources of bioavailable protein, which are generally animal sourced foods. So people are really afraid of eating protein, um, especially meat. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. And there continues to be fear mongering around yeah. dietary cholesterol, saturated fat, Yes, these nutrients. Like I get it if you're trying to make the case that added saturated fats, like in the form right. of, you know, for example, butter, you know, or, or something like that, coconut oil, for example, that maybe it's suboptimal to be to be putting butter in your coffee every every morning. Right. You can, you, can, yeah. you can go overboard. You can. You can go overboard. But when talking about the saturated fat contained in natural whole fat containing foods, to me, it just it is completely senseless. Right. And then you run into the issue with, you know, when you start reducing those foods solely based on their saturated fat or cholesterol content, for example, then you start eliminating really nutrient dense foods. And then you're eliminating sometimes your only source of these specific micronutrients from your diet. So choline is a great example. The best food sources are egg yolks and liver and organ meats. Hmm. Um, those are both really high cholesterol foods that you're often recommended to limit if that's your goal, limiting cholesterol. But then you end up with pretty much guaranteed choline deficiency. Hmm. Like already 94% of pregnant women don't consume enough choline. So if you're going to take out eggs, egg yolks, for example, that, that explains about 50% of choline intake in the average U.S. diet. So you take out eggs, and now your choline intake has just been cut in half. Like, Plummeting. Yes. So it's a problem. Wow. Are there, are there many dietitians that think like you? There's, there are some of us out there. There are. Um, I think it's, it's challenging because the, the way that our education is structured is... You know, they, they want to create dietitians that go into hospitals and fill a very specific role in hospitals. And our education arguably does a good job of pre- preparing us for that. Um, and I think the science background, I do appreciate. Like, I'm glad I had to take organic chemistry, actually, because it makes I, I can understand a lot more um, research and biochemistry because of it. But if you're not willing to really critically look at the dietary guidelines, like if you're just taking everything you learn at face value and not digging deeper, you're just gonna spout out the same calories in, calories out, low fat, high carb diet, half your grains whole, like, uh, you know, all the same things that we always hear from dietitians, which, you know, it kind of, um, kind of undermines people's trust in the profession because a lot of people have tried those dietary approaches and, it doesn't really work very well for their overall health. So, hmm, yeah, we need a di- we need a different way. Yeah. So, going back to protein, what are the benefits of eating higher amounts of protein, particularly as you start to, you know, whether you're in that sort of pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, you know, you're pregnant. Um, what are the benefits of, of eating yeah. higher protein? I mean, one of the biggest ones is is blood sugar regulation. Um, I don't know if you've experienced with or experimented with different breakfasts. You know, you have oatmeal or cereal for breakfast versus eggs and bacon. What is the difference with your energy levels and how you feel? Have you ever worn a continuous glucose monitor or just spot checked your blood sugar after a meal? Like what happens when you're having a low protein, high carb meal or the opposite? Um, Any of us who have experimented, including myself, you see a really striking difference in how stable your blood sugar levels are, which ultimately stabilizes your insulin levels. That plays a very important role in um, egg quality, uh, fertility, chances of conceiving any given menstrual cycle, like the fewer spikes and crashes you have in your blood sugar, the better. Wow. Um, So certainly from that perspective, blood sugar balance, keeping insulin levels at a healthy level is huge and that directly impacts our level of inflammation. Um, But during pregnancy specifically, you have to remember like your body expands dramatically to accommodate the growth of your baby. And your baby is really made mostly of protein. I mean, you talk (laughs) about like, you know, what are the macronutrients that is growing this brand new human being? And really it's mostly protein. Um, So we do need more for all of these processes to work well, like your blood vessels have to expand and contract properly to accommodate increased blood volume. Your uterus grows to the size of a watermelon, like the the collagen content alone of the uterus goes up 800 percent in pregnancy. Wow. Huge. Like there's just massive expansion going on. Um, So when you don't get enough protein, it just can you can run into some issues. So there's, mm. you know, a higher risk of fetal growth restriction. The baby doesn't grow to the size that's appropriate for that baby. Um, 
You can have issues with premature rupture of membranes, um, higher rates of preeclampsia, certainly higher rates of gestational diabetes, again, because of that blood sugar and insulin connection. So to me, it's really foundational. It is the macronutrient that we should focus the most on uh, in pregnancy. It's fascinating. I mean, it, it makes me think of like, I'm not a homeowner yet, but if you were to put an extension on your house, right, the building protein are the building blocks. Right. It's like carbs and fat are not the building blocks that right. you're using to put that extension on the house. It's yeah. protein, right? Protein, yeah. it's the bricks, it's the mortar, it's the wood. Yep. And so it, that makes perfect sense. Yep. And then because it's so satiating, your chances of just accidentally overeating go significantly down when you're getting enough protein. If you've ever paid attention to your hunger and fullness cues after you have like a steak versus, I don't know, um, a bowl of pasta, it's different, right? You have your bowl of pasta and then like an hour after dinner, you're like mm, raiding the pantry, looking for snacks, looking for dessert. And after a big steak, you might not actually be hungry for dessert. You might be like, yeah, I'm set. I'm good. You know, yeah. your body is always looking for um, filling that, that protein requirement. Hmm. Now I've never been pregnant. Oh man, I never will be, but I have a, uh, a niece and I have exposure th to that process through, you know, she's now one and I'm, I'm close with my brother and his, and the baby mama. And I, you know, I got to experience that through that vantage point. And one thing that stood out to me as being re really interesting is the wavering appetite of the pregnant yeah. Woman. So how do you yeah. reconcile that? Like we know we have these these massively increased yeah. needs for nutrition, protein among among other nutrients, right. um, but you're not always always hungry. Right. It's a struggle. So first of all, uh, to to reassure people, <laughs> oftentimes um, for many of our nutrient needs, there the needs don't increase dramatically at the moment of conception or at the moment that you get a positive pregnancy test. Usually the increase in needs starts kind of gradually towards the end of the first trimester. So the first trimester, I mean, you have to think the baby's still super, super tiny. Um, your body is certainly very busy. There's tons of hormonal changes and you're building a placenta along with this embryo and all of the, the cells are differentiating into which organs are going to be. I mean, it's the early part of pregnancy is just very, very complex. Um, but the baby's not accruing a lot of mass hmm. at that point. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, also, until the placenta is fully formed, which is around the end of the first trimester, early second trimester, the embryo and ultimately the fetus, they call it different names for different stages of, of pregnancy, um, it's really being fueled by something called endometrial glands. So there are little structures within the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, essentially what a woman sheds each month with her menstru menstrual cycle, you know. Um, but that is really the first home, the nutrient-rich home for that embryo. And so really you're kind of relying on your preconception nutrient reserves in that early part of pregnancy. Mm. Um, and that coincides at the time when nausea, vomiting, food aversions tend to be at their height. First trimester sometimes up till like the first half of pregnancy. Some people get a little more unlucky and it lasts for a while longer. But that's really when those food, food aversions and the nausea and the like, oh, I don't really want to eat can kind of kick in. So um, we can like have all this like high level knowledge about what all of these nutrients do at different stages. And ultimately you have to just make the best choices that you can with whatever symptoms are being thrown your way at that particular stage. And I have two kids, you know, I went through the nausea phase too, um, maybe not too horrible. And, and certainly when I was like trying to get in enough protein and just eat little bits frequently, um, that definitely lessened my symptoms. But um, there were certain things that were totally averse to me that normally I'm fine with. Interesting. What? So, um, so interestingly, like cooking in cast iron pans, the smell of a preheating cast iron pan was like the most nauseating smell to me of all time. Whoa. Um, and we cook like not exclusively, but all of our frying pans are cast iron. An egg that had been um, cooked too much. So like has like a brown layer on it, like unacceptable. Whoa. Like, cannot be eaten. 
Well, an um, overcooked egg is also kind of smelly, right? Like more, more of, you get more of that sulfur. Yeah, yeah. So they had to be cooked a but. certain way. Like I could do eggs, but you know, with cheese and salsa, like anything sort of Mexican food was like, that was okay. That like stayed down well. So smells are just weird. Um, the smell of like meat just starting to cook totally off-putting that's like, so weird you put in like a pot roast in your slow cooker instant pot and just the smell of that is like Whoa. so you know put the slow cooker outside to cook have somebody else cook a meal for you if the meal was served to me and i wasn't the one who had to prepare it totally fine huh and it's you know it's different for every person so my things that were averse are not the next person's aversions do we have any understanding of where those aversions come from there's all sorts of theories, and um, some of them have to do with like food safety, like old school evolutionary kind of food safety concerns. Like before we had refrigeration, you know, you uh, somebody in your tribe hunted an animal, and like fresh meat spoils relatively quickly. So maybe that sort of like mm, you know hmm. raw meat not being appealing maybe is from that. Um, there's there's some uh, there's just a whole bunch of different theories on why it happens, but I don't know that we have any really clear answers. Like, yeah. Some people are really averse to certain vegetables. Um, I don't know that that was a huge one for me, but uh, there's a theory that the compounds, you know, plants have all of these defense chemicals um, to help protect the plant from pests and deter animals from eating a whole bunch of the plant. They might take a nibble, but they're not gonna eat the whole thing down. Um, so there are theories that maybe in early pregnancy when the embryo is particularly susceptible to like teratogens, like chemicals that could cause some sort of a defect or cause you to miscarry. Um, there's a theory that maybe this aversion to fresh vegetables carries all the way back to like when we were hunter gatherers. Wow. I mean, Nowadays, most of our fruits and vegetables we're eating are so hybridized that the levels of defense chemicals is like significantly less than when you're foraging wild foods. But still, that that remains another theory. That is a great point. And that's also another wrench to the whole like carnivore philosophy that we should be avoiding these so-called plant de plant defense chemicals at all costs. Yeah. They really have been so diluted from the food supply relative to how they appeared in the human diet for the yeah. vast majority of our evolution. Yeah, that and also, you know, the the way in which you prepare your foods can drastically change the levels of those compounds. So, you know, the whole concern about phytic acid, which is a, a rightful concern. Actually, I did a whole research project on this in college, but um, phytic acid is a compound found in grains, legumes, uh, nuts and seeds, especially when they're raw. And when you soak or sprout or ferment them, the levels of phytic acid go way, way, way down. Mm. People are concerned about phytic acid because it impairs mineral absorption, which is true. Um, but when you look at how a lot of traditional cultures prepared their grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes, there was soaking, sprouting, fermenting, um, or a really long cooking time that breaks down those compounds. So, you know, we have to like, kind of way, hmm. <laughs> way both. Um, and I think just pay attention to how your body feels. Like some people really do quite bad with nightshade vegetables. They're like really sensitive to solanine, you know? Hey, if that's triggering your joint pain or digestive issues or whatever, hey, if I was you, I would avoid them. But it doesn't trigger any issue for me. So I'm going to enjoy the tomatoes off my tomato plant, you know? I love it. Yeah. Yeah, love, love a tomato. Um, what about cravings? Like we yeah. talked about some uh, some of the aversions that had developed for you, but what about like cravings? So it, I guess kind of like the aversions, there's the same idea that there's maybe some things going on physiologically that are driving the specific cravings. So there's a theory that uh, maybe you need more of a certain nutrient, so you're craving the food that has that nutrient. Uh, cravings for dairy, for example, are really common during pregnancy. Is it the need for more protein? Is it the need for more calcium, uh, riboflavin? Dairy is really high in riboflavin. That plays a really important role in methylation, just like folate. Like people don't realize that riboflavin is like the cofactor for MTHFR. Hmm. So um, is it that? Is it the iodine? Dairy is really rich in iodine. Is it vitamin D? Is it B12? The B12 in dairy is actually really highly absorbable. Um, so there's all sorts of theories centered around 
increased nutrient requirements. Um, certain cravings can be a sign that you're actually deficient in things like craving for ice or chewing ice. What's that about? I've heard of that that's, recently. That's highly associated with anemia, iron deficiency anemia specifically. Um, Why would that be something that we would crave if we're deficient in iron? I cannot answer that question. <laughs> I have no idea. That's so weird. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, there's also cravings that are... Um, I think we have to separate like pregnancy specific cravings and just food cravings in general, because of course the food industry spends billions of dollars engineering processed foods to mm. hit all those dopamine receptors and make you want to eat more of them. So, you know, if your craving is for, um, you know, flaming hot Cheetos or something, is it really a craving? Like, does your body really need a nutrient that's in flaming hot Cheetos? I mean, <laughs> Maybe you do need some more salt um, or some more carbs, I suppose, but also that food is engineered to be highly addictive. So um, that's another consideration. Or is it like, you know, a, a mental, emotional thing? Maybe you're craving um, the mac and cheese that your mom used to make. Hmm. And so it's like hitting that, you know, memory receptor of like, oh, yeah, I remember my mom would make this and I was so comforted and I'm feeling kind of lonely. Like you kind of have to break down, like tease out what the craving is about mm. um certainly like cravings for pickles olives really salty foods that one makes a lot of sense to me in terms of the nutrient requirement because you do need more salt during pregnancy um so just kind of try to tease out and then based on what your craving is i mean you either give in a little bit or if it's a healthy food i wouldn't hold back or if it's like something really truly not healthy at all maybe try to find something that's a little bit better like I once had cravings for um, sour gummy worms in pregnancy. And I remember I'm like at the grocery store. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, this is like a lot of corn syrup. And I'm like, oh, all the food dies. Like I can handle a little corn syrup, but like this is a lot of food dies. <laughs> like this is just not good for me. I'm not, I'm, I just can't buy it. You know, once you buy it, it's going down the hatch. But I found um, dried tart cherries were like the perfect thing to fill that craving it gave me like the sour and sweet combination and sure they're high sugar but it's cherries you know um so that was like a trade-off that i found that like okay i'm hitting the the sort of flavor that i want um without like red dye number 40. yeah i mean you still have to you still want to consider everything all the accumulated knowledge that you have that you have about nutrition and healthy eating just because you happen to be craving something that is an ultra processed food item right. I and mean, you should still be aware of the fact that that's probably not the best choice yep. for you but i mean i guess in the moment if it makes you happy you know and still i mean i don't claim to be any sort of saint either like when my nausea was really strong for whatever reason salt and vinegar chips really like took the edge off i could have some salt and vinegar chips my stomach would settle and then i could eat something a little more nutritious and mm. it's like all right if that's what it takes I, i'm gonna have some salt and vinegar chips it's all right well one of the biggest like i think harms of or potential harms wrought by these ultra processed foods is the is the is just the sheer caloric density of them but don't your dear caloric needs go up during pregnancy they do go up and it's uh debatable by how much they go up mm. um but most conventional recommendations are about three to 500 extra calories per day. Um, and that increase in caloric needs starts in about the beginning of the, the second trimester. Oh, interesting. So um, when you think about it, the actual amount of food that you need is not that much more than when you're not pregnant. Three to 500 calories is like an extra snack or two, or yeah. maybe slightly larger portions at your meals. Um, but at the same time, a lot of your nutrient requirements do go up quite a bit you know? mm. um, so you do want to be focusing I think less on increasing the volume of food you're consuming and more so on increasing the nutrient density of what you're eating and that's the biggest biggest issue with ultra processed foods is you're simply displacing other things from your diet that are highly nutritious so okay you filled up on 200 calories of salt and vinegar chips but then what did you not eat because of that um, that's something to consider yeah. Wow. Super, super important. I want to touch on collagen because you brought that up um, yeah. earlier. The 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 relationship between the uterus, the growth of the uterus and collagen. And I saw you, you posted about 
there was a study, I forget the journal in the year, but that um, they found for pregnant women that collagen didn't doesn't like disrupt amino acid balance. And so yeah. that led to the conclusion that we should actually count it as a as a valuable protein source, particularly in the yes. context of pregnancy. Yes. So that study, I'm trying to remember the year on it, but that was actually in a general non-pregnant population. And they displaced about a third of dietary protein with collagen. Hmm. And by the way, they were only hitting the RDA for protein. So a fairly low protein intake um, and still getting about a third of their protein from collagen didn't mess up amino acid balance. Um, and in fact, improved uh, like amino acid metabolism in the body. Um, previously, people were kind of anti-collagen or anti-gelatin. Um, because it is missing one of the essential amino acids known as tryptophan. So they're like, oh, collagen, the protein in collagen doesn't count because it doesn't have tryptophan. And to that, I've always had some qualms with that because we count the protein from beans. Yeah. <laughs> and beans are missing essential amino acids. Exactly. But when you buy a can of beans, it lists the protein with no disclaimer. You buy a can of, or buy a bag rather of uh, pork rinds, and they actually list it under the protein, uh, not a significant source of dietary protein. So, like the pork rinds got a warning label, <laughs> the beans and legumes didn't. It's really the same issue we're talking about, just a different essential amino acid. One hundred percent. So yeah, we can we can let that old myth to rest. You can count your collagen towards your protein intake. It should not be your sole source of protein, which if you're eating a normal diet and adding some collagen to your coffee in the morning or something, you're eating other protein. You're going to balance out your amino acids just fine. Yeah. If you're eating yeah. a particularly an omnivorous diet, right, you're getting enough tryptophan through that to offset Definitely. what you're not getting from collagen. But collagen provides a little bit of everything else. Yeah. I mean, it provides like there's leucine in collagen, a little bit yeah. of it. Is there any value of collagen specifically though? Like, is there any, do you think that yeah. there's reason to supplement with it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and just collagen rich foods in general, um, not even necessarily a supplement, although I'm not opposed to supplementation, but collagen rich foods, which you get from your, you know, nose to tail animal foods, anything with bone skin, connective tissue, um, like you make a batch of pulled pork, you make bone broth, you make uh, uh, chicken wings and you eat the skin and like the connective tissue kind of melts into it a little bit, you're getting collagen from that. Um, but yeah, collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. Like a third of our body proteins are made of collagen. And um, some of the specific amino acids in collagen that are like abnormally high in collagen compared to other protein, like glycine, for example, the needs for that increase dramatically uh, during pregnancy. So glycine, normally they call it uh, a conditionally essential amino acid, something that we don't really need to get in the diet at all times. But if you are in a time of stress or high demand, which includes pregnancy, you do need to have a dietary source. Um, and the glycine that's in there is really important for like all of the growth of this baby, because you have to think you're growing a whole new human being who's also about a third collagen but also all the roles that collagen plays in your system. So we talked about the uterus being very high in collagen, um, the amniotic sac being high in collagen, uh, your blood vessels have quite a bit of collagen and glycine, and that does help your blood vessels expand and contract properly to accommodate the, the higher blood volume. So, um, and glycine itself has some pretty positive research in terms of its effects on um, managing high blood pressure and high blood sugar. So I do think there's a role Definitely for collagen-rich foods, and if you're not getting much of them, supplemental collagen uh, during pregnancy. And collagen is, is exclusively found in animal source foods, right? Exclusively, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. What about critics of collagen supplementation will say that, you know, you eat collagen, it gets disassembled into, into its constituent amino acids. There's no guarantee that you're actually creating new collagen in your body with the consumption of dietary collagen. Except that there's studies showing that your body does exactly that. Um, there's also quite a bit of research now on some specific peptides found in collagen. Um, so not just talking about breaking it all the way down to the individual amino acid level, um, but depending on how the collagen supplement is made, if it maintains some of those bioactive collagen peptides, those do in fact get incorporated into your mm. tissues, into your like bones and, and skin, for example. I love, I mean, I take collagen. 
Yeah. Yeah, on a yeah. on a fairly consistent basis. I wouldn't say that it's part of my like my staple supplement regimen, right. but I take it, you know, definitely a few times a week. Yeah. Yeah. Um that's super 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 interesting. Um choline is another one of these nutrients that you mentioned. Yeah. And uh what did you say 94% of people of women don't consume the adequate intake? Correct. Correct. Pretty consistently, if you look at dietary intake across age, sex uh, in the U.S., less than 90 percent of people are, are hitting the adequate intake level for choline. Um, it's an interesting nutrient because it's the most recent one that was added to our list of essential nutrients. So it was added to the list in 1998. We haven't added any other essential nutrients to the list since, since 1998. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Probably a problem. Um, yeah, and so when they first identified that it was important, they actually assigned men to eat uh, to essentially like a, a choline-deprived diet, and then they watched what happened. Because we do have uh, systems within our body, mechanisms in our body to create uh, choline. And so the whole idea was like, well, do we really need it? Do we not need it? If the body can make it, maybe we're fine. It's not essential. Same argument for uh, non-essential amino acids. Like glycine. By the way, like glycine. Yeah. Um, but when these men were on this really low choline diet, they developed all sorts of problems. They had like muscle pain. They developed fatty liver disease mm. and dysfunction. Um, and when you supplemented them with choline, those things went away. So that's when they first set the adequate intake uh, level. And then they extrapolated that based on body weight and other things for women and for pregnant women and breastfeeding women and there's different different goals for each of those stages but now we have data showing that those levels are a significant underestimate hmm. so um, we now have studies randomized controlled trials like really high quality data where they've assigned two sets of pregnant women um, half get just above the adequate intake level 480 milligrams per day the other half get pretty much about double that, so 930 milligrams per day. And then they look at outcomes. They were looking specifically in this trial what happens to the infant's brain development because choline is really, really vital, not only for our liver function, but for our brain function. And we know it plays a really important role in fetal brain development. Um, so they followed these children all the way through toddlerhood, and now they've published data going all the way until age seven. And the kids born to mothers who had the high choline intake scored better at all time points on essentially almost all of the, the brain development um, tests. So like problem solving skills, uh, attention span, reaction time. So what does that say about our adequate intake level? I mean, the other group was getting 30 milligrams more than the adequate intake level. Mm. Still the ones who had the double intake. And again, kids like did much better. And again, like ninety four percent of women don't even don't even consume that level, right? Don't even hit that. Yeah, wow. and especially your vegetarians and vegans, they're on, they're getting like sometimes only half of what the adequate intake level is. Oof. They're getting like two hundred something milligrams, and the adequate intake level is set at four hundred and fifty. Um, and again, a lot of that has to do with low animal food intake, but specifically, like for vegans, when you take the eggs out and there's no egg yolks coming in then choline intake really plummets. Wow. So yeah. eggs are eggs are one of the top most accessible sources, but what are some other sources of Absolutely. choline? Absolutely. Well, liver and organ meats, which, you know, everybody loves to hate, but <laughs> they are quite nutrient dense. Um, your other animal foods pretty much all have it as well, just in lower concentrations. Hmm. So um, pretty much all of your muscle meats and seafood also have choline. Dairy products have choline, although significantly lower concentration. And then you do have it in plant sources. Um, so your beans and legumes, uh, nuts and seeds, and certain vegetables, cruciferous vegetables especially, and then one oddball, shiitake mushrooms, uh, do have choline. Hmm. And if you pull up my Instagram, you might have to scroll a while, but I do have a graphic showing um, the um, the quantity of those plant foods that you have to consume to meet the choline content in a single egg yolk and it's it's quite significant so yeah. one i remember off the top of my head you know to match the choline content of an egg you need two cups of cooked beans so 
it has choline. It just becomes sometimes an unreasonable quantity of a food to consume to get the same amount of a nutrient, which again explains why vegetarians tend to be low in it. Yeah, I mean, especially if you're struggling with low appetite, I couldn't imagine trying to scarf yeah. down yeah. two cups of beans every day. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's like a daily re requirement, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a lot. <laughs> you mentioned organ meats. Are you a big organ meat? I'm a fan of organ meats. Do you consume yeah. a lot of them? Not a lot, interestingly. I'm kind of glad you asked this question because um, I do spend some time. I highlight liver, for example, in my book. Um, I have some detailed information on liver and organ meats on my website, and I'm a big fan of them. Um, because they are so nutrient dense, you don't need to eat a very large quantity of them to benefit. Um, and I think we're so divorced from our foods and their origins that when I encourage people to consume organ meats and then they think they need to sit down to like <laughs> six ounces of liver three times a week or something or have organ meats every single day, they're, they're missing important context. Like if you've ever purchased a cow share or any kind of animal share from a, from a farmer, um, you get all the meat from the animal and if you request it, the organs and the bones and fat and other things, um, which I've done for over a decade. And when you get that, you realize there's one liver there's one heart like the liver on a cow can be quite big it could be several pounds or, or bigger i've gotten a liver that's up to eight pounds from one of my cow shares um but that is in comparison to hundreds of pounds of muscle meat you know what i mean so yes consume the organ meats but they don't need to be like multiple meals every single week. So my favorite way to do it, since I didn't grow up eating liver and the flavor of it is like not my favorite always. It's not 10 out um, of 10. Yeah, <laughs> it is not. Um, is I'll make a big batch of pate, which I actually do enjoy the flavor of pate. So I have a recipe of it uh, for it in my book, but I'll make a big batch of pate. I'll freeze it into either ice cube trays or small jars. And then I add like two to three ounces per pound of meat um, to a ground meat dish, like meatloaf, shepherd's pie, chili, um, something like that. I don't like it in burgers. I just want my burger to be pure beef. Um, but these other other things where there's, you know, herbs and spices and other flavors in it to balance it out, it, it adds a richness to the flavor without being overwhelming. Um, and then you're also not going overboard on like a huge quantity of organ meats all in one sitting. You're just getting like, a little bit, which is really traditionally how they would be consumed. I mean, you look at, I actually cite some data in my book on, I think it was like a, a sheep farming community in, in Africa, and they consumed liver, um, you know, two to three times a month. Hmm. You know, it, it, it's something that you consume, but not every single day. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You're not saying that people need to be sitting down eating like a liver steak right. every night, right? Right. For yeah. the for the benefits. What about concerns about vitamin A during pregnancy? Yeah. Isn't that a is that is that a, is that a real concern? Because uh, liver yes beef liver no. is like one of the top sources, right? Correct. Yes. Yes and no. So um, yes, that's long been the warning against consuming liver in pregnancy is that it's high in vitamin A. Um, so this is kind of a long answer, but so when when you go back to where that concern originally came from. That came from studies in the 1990s where they supplemented pregnant women with high dose synthetic vitamin A, not liver, synthetic vitamin A. And then there was a slightly higher rate of, of birth defects in the group that had the consistently high synthetic vitamin A intake. That was extrapolated to mean, well, we need to avoid all sources of preformed vitamin A. Don't consume liver whatsoever. Interestingly, when you look at the kind of uh, the, like blood metabolites of, of vitamin A metabolism that are associated with these um, birth defects, mm -hmm. you find that compared to consuming synthetic vitamin A versus liver, you don't get the same spike in those problematic birth defect causing compounds, they wow. call them teratogens. Um, also, vitamin A, when taken you know, synthetically, by itself, not in the correct proportion to other fat soluble vitamins, can build up in your body to toxic levels. This is indeed like a, a known phenomenon. 
And it's true. Um, the same does not appear to be true for vitamin A coming from liver. Hmm. Um, that said, I still recommend that people consume an amount of vitamin A that is below the threshold considered teratogenic. Even though it's natural source and everything, out of an abundance of caution, I recommend people do stick to consuming less than 10,000 IUs of preformed vitamin A per day. And you'll stay below that threshold if you're consuming three to six ounces of liver per week, which most people, it's like pulling teeth to get them to consume liver once a year <laughs> or ever. Um, and on top of that, the percent of women who are not consuming enough vitamin A in the US is like 80%. Wow. 80%. So we're going to take away the most rich source of vitamin A out of your diet, out of concerns over potential birth defects from studies that weren't even done on liver consumption. Uh, meanwhile, we have 80% of women who are deficient in vitamin A. And I just want to add one more interesting thing. Again, if you scroll way back in my Instagram, there is a, a research post I did on birth defects from vitamin A and why context matters. Pretty sure that's the first slide and there's like a whole bunch of images in there. But there are, while vitamin A can cause certain birth defects in excess, um, a lack of vitamin A can also cause birth defects because vitamin A is absolutely vital for the differentiation of your cells. So this very early embryonic development, those first eight weeks of pregnancy where your cells are determining what organs they're going to form, you need vitamin A for those processes to work properly. Um, and so one specific birth defect, it's called uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So your diaphragm doesn't form properly and then you can have like digestive organs up in your chest cavity and stuff. It's, it's, it's life-threatening, very, very severe birth defect. The rates of that uh, specific birth defect have been on the rise quite a bit. Hmm. And we have, you look over the last, I don't want to butcher the stats, but it is in that Instagram post. When you, when you look over the past 20, 30 years, you have fewer than, I think it's 20 cases of, of uh, birth defects caused by vitamin A toxicity. And you have over a million cases of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Wow. And it has very, very, very strong link to vitamin A deficiency. Not just animal models, we're talking lots of human data as well. You test these children and these mothers who have suffered from this catastrophic situation and they're both deficient almost every single time. So, um, you know, we have to like, there's always context to just about everything and it's hard to communicate that while I'm like, yes, consume your organ meats, but don't eat them every day. And yes, vitamin A is important. And yes, it's possible that you can get too much. There's like this, you know, <laughs> this little nuance layer um, that I, I try to communicate and it's challenging on social media to get it across. Yeah, but you're so good at it. So just to, just to um, make, make it clear, people are really freaked out about over consuming vitamin A when the yep. reality is that a lot there are way there's a way higher proportion of children being born with birth defects that have a strong link to vitamin a deficiency yes as compared to children being born with conditions related to excess vitamin a correct wow yes damn so don't be afraid of liver no don't be afraid of liver but you really don't need to consume more than like three to six ounces a week yeah. so um that might look like one three ounce portion of liver if you're eating it all at once or maybe you know one or two meals with this like hidden liver concept i talk about with the hmm. ground liver the ground pate in a, a ground meat dish but you don't have to eat it every single day or if you are or if you're supplementing with like a you know desiccated liver as so many people are just make sure that you're within that threshold hmm. um and even some of the biggest liver proponents like paul saladino those are within his recommendations on liver too. So um, it's really like we don't need extreme quantities and even the biggest proponents of consuming liver seem to fall at about the same amount of intake. Interesting. And is chicken liver just as, as viable an option or is it specifically beef? It's it's also a good option. Um, it's more palatable. It is more palatable and the 
texture is beef liver can be a little bit tough. It depends how you cook it, I've learned. Um, but yeah, they have slightly different nutritional profiles. I do have an article on um, liver and organ meats on my website where I have the micronutrient breakdown in a chart. Um, so just off the top of my head, I know chicken liver tends to be higher in folate and iron, um, but beef liver tends to be higher in, I believe, choline. It's definitely higher in vitamin A. Um, so there's slight differences. I say pick whichever one you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. What about... Um Fish, like a lot of the yeah. information that you're that you're presenting is news to me, but I am somewhat familiar with the fact that uh, women who consume more fish during and sort of in that peri pregnancy window, yeah. their children also seem to be brighter, smarter, for, smarter for lack of a better term. Yeah. Yes. What's the deal there? So yeah, there's some pretty strong data that if you consume about 12 ounces of seafood per week during pregnancy, um, it's associated with better you know, brain development outcomes, um, particularly compared to no fish. No seafood whatsoever is associated with the worst brain development outcomes. Um, so part of this has to do certainly with the omega-3s. Everybody wants to highlight the omega-3s. Seafood, um, especially certain fatty fish like salmon, sardines, are quite high in the omega-3 fat DHA, which does play a vital role in brain development. But seafood has a lot more than just omega-3s, and I think that usually is where the conversation stops. It's just like seafood, omega-3s, and that's it. It's also really rich in uh, you know, choline, for example, vitamin D. If you're doing fish that has um, small bones, like say you do canned salmon or canned sardines that are canned with the bones, really rich source of bioavailable calcium. Definitely for anybody who doesn't consume dairy or can't consume dairy, fish canned with the bones is an excellent option. Um, very high in glycine, it's high in B12, high in B6, high in iodine and selenium. Mm. There's very, very strong data on um, iodine sufficiency and brain development outcomes, um, and also just general fertility. Um, so I think Probably the iodine and the DHA are the most crucial ones where it's tricky to get those from other foods if you're not consuming seafood. Um, but I know that usually the DHA is the one that gets the spotlight. Hmm. What about, I mean, every, particularly with, with regard to animal source foods, every food category now has its own tribe of people that are fear-mongering it. And so with yeah. regard to fish, you hear a lot that, oh, the, the oceans are so polluted and Yep. You know, there's mercury and fish and like it's not it's not worth eating. Yeah. Do the do the benefits still outweigh the risks? So the mercury one is an interesting point. Um, there has actually been studies looking at uh, mercury and how much like your body absorbs based on what else you're eating at that time. And since most types of fish, not all, are rich in selenium, Selenium does seem to offset the amount of mercury that's absorbed. Um, it essentially binds to the mercury and makes it unavailable to your body. So that is one consideration. Um, granted, there are some types of seafood that are really low in selenium and high in mercury. Shark is one of them, so don't eat shark while you're pregnant. There are some too where I think the levels of mercury are so high that it's probably best just to choose another type of fish. Hmm. So um, swordfish, I already said shark, um, king mackerel and tilefish. And then some people also will throw certain types of tuna in that category as well. Um, and that actually does fall within FDA guidance as well. Um, they also recommend about 12 ounces per week of fish uh, for pregnant women and just choosing lower mercury options when you have the option. Um, as far as all of the uh, persistent organic pollutants, your PCBs, dioxins, um, those essentially fat-soluble toxins, yeah, it is one of those dilemmas where our planet is really polluted. And um, some of these toxins, which really resist breakdown, that's why they call them persistent, um, they do bioaccumulate up the food chain and they do accumulate usually in the fatty tissues. A lot of them are fat soluble. Um, so you're kind of at odds, right? Like you can either not consume your seafood because you're concerned about persistent organic pollutants, or you consume the seafood and get the other benefits of these other things and avoid deficiency and DHA and iodine and other nutrients. 
ultimately the data we have so far, if you look at it, you know, big picture, we still see better brain development outcomes in those babies who were born to mothers who had more seafood, not less. So I think you do the best you can with, you know, choosing the lowest mercury options, pos lowest mercury options possible. And then um, you got to just kind of understand there's toxins everywhere. So you're getting toxins in literally everything you eat. Yeah. <laughs> and so do you want to live your life in complete uh, fear or do you just want to like make the best of, of what you can? I mean, I got a, a next door neighbor who has his own garden and sprays it with pesticides. No way. Yes. <laughs> right next door. Yes. That's you know, frustrating. It's frustrating, but like, that's the world we live in. Hmm. Am I gonna be? Am I going to, gonna be so afraid that I don't go outside and spend time in my yard? No. no. I happen to see it, but hey, if you're going to a public park somewhere, they also sprayed that grass with Roundup, and you know, it's a. Uh, Damn. I yeah. mean, does he know who you are? Like, <laughs> he doesn't care. Yeah, he's an old guy. <laughs> oh man, that's a shame. So what? I mean, how do we? How do we fight back? Is it just like? continuing to stack the odds in our favor with eating nutrient dense diets, exercising, like doing all the things. So my best recommendation on toxins, and I, I do have a chapter on toxins in real food for pregnancy, like where I talk about some of these difficult subjects, cause you're kind of making the best of a polluted world. Hmm. Um, but I would say probably some of your def best defenses is to focus on improving your body's ability to detoxify chemicals. And when you, you look at all of our detox pathways and yes, our body is always detoxing, whatever, but we can do things to support it. Right. Yeah. Um, protein is a really, really big one because a lot of our enzyme, well, all of our enzymes are made of protein, but you need sufficient protein for proper liver function. Plus your protein rich foods often have most of the micronutrients that you need to detoxify. So your glutathione, your, your liver's major detoxification enzyme, needs glycine, it needs selenium, it needs cysteine. Um, these things are coming in from mostly your protein-rich animal foods. Um, so arguably, yes, you're taking in more, but you may be excreting more as well. Like mm. there was an interesting study on um, cadmium and shellfish, for example. And when you consume more shellfish, you are consuming more cadmium. There are heavy metals in seafood, including shellfish. Also in plants, though, right? In plants, I mean, not to minimize well. yes. the impact that heavy metals might have on yes. human health, but yes. as you said, they're everywhere. Yes, they're also in plants. And some plants are really highly efficient at um, kind of like detoxifying the soil. So like mustard, for example, it was really efficient at pulling um, toxins out of the soil. But anyways, wow. side note, um, even though the group uh, consuming more shellfish had, were, they were consuming more cadmium, 99% of it still was excreted. So their levels of cadmium in their body were equivalent to the group that was eating barely any shellfish. Hmm. So, you know, some minerals do seem to offset um, how badly those heavy metals affect us. So I gave you the selenium and mercury um, example, but um, lead and iron is another one. Like the more iron you have, the more lead that you're going to excrete. If you're really deficient in iron, the more lead you're going to absorb. The heavy metals are kind of just like, if there's a deficiency, they're going to try to take the place of the essential minerals hmm. uh, in your body. So the more zinc and copper and iron and selenium and calcium and things that you're consuming, the minerals that actually have, um, you know, essential functions in your body, the less of the heavy metals your body is going to absorb. So it just comes back to eat a nutrient dense diet and, and make sure that you're, that you are yeah. as robust and resilient as possible. Um, using Pretty all much. of the, the various dietary and lifestyle modalities that we talk about again and again and again in this yeah. space. Um, it helps. It helps. It's a non-trivial way to stack the odds in your favor. Yes. And I think we can't discount that, like, when you're really stressed out, your body starts not functioning optimally. Hmm. So if you're so in this silo of, like, I'm surrounded by toxins and they're all killing me and, like, this is terrible and my liver's overloaded, like, 
guess what? You're probably going to suffer more. Like, <laughs> lighten up a little bit. <laughs> Drink your water. Eat your nutritious food. Sleep. Like, <laughs> just, it's it's going to be okay, you know? It's so true. I mean, we made it here as a species, right? I mean, th- we've come all, we've come this far. Yeah. What about, okay, so with regard to fish, this is something that, um, again, I know nothing about, but there's this concern about while pregnant eating sushi yes right along with some other foods other food items like deli meat soft cheeses i believe things like that yeah but yeah are those concerns warranted i mean if i were a pregnant woman yeah i happen to love sushi yeah that would be like a really big uh you know hurdle for me to have to uh to overcome yeah you know if it's like have a baby or like um go without sushi. Con- continue with, continue <laughs> eating you know as much sushi as my heart desires i'm gonna go with the sushi probably yeah so this one's interesting because it has to do with the culture you're in so in the u.s it's all fairly strict on the food safety guidelines and there's a fairly lengthy list of foods not to eat over concerns primarily of you know food poisoning food safety um And some of them are warranted, like your your immune system is more susceptible to foodborne illness when you're pregnant. Your your immune system adapts in a way that it can allow a a human with different DNA from you to develop within your body. Right. Hmm. Um, And it has to do that by like downregulating your immune function a little bit, which can make you more susceptible to getting sick if you eat something spoiled or whatever. But um, you look at the relative rates of getting sick from different foods, um, it's actually really, really, really low. So like rates of listeriosis in pregnancy are, are far below 1%. It's like a fraction of a percent. Um, with the sushi part specifically, you go to Japan and sushi is encouraged during pregnancy. You even go to the UK and they condone it on the uh, NHS materials because sushi grade fish is flash frozen and kept frozen for long enough that it will deactivate whatever parasites are in it. Legally, so, that's supposed to occur here too. But I feel like some restaurants maybe don't, they cut corners. But I, there, I think legally sushi here also has to be flash frozen you to, know, to kill parasites. And I've, I've lived in Alaska and can tell you that most of the fish that's caught, that's commercially processed, it is flash frozen. Um, it, whether it's, if it's not happening on the boat, it's happening at the processing facility and it is shipped frozen because fish spoils extremely fast, hmm. right? So they're not going to let their harvest go to waste. Almost all of it is frozen. What you're getting at a fish counter in a grocery store is all previously frozen and is defrosted unless you're at a fishmonger and it's like that day's catch, right? Um, so I think most of it actually has been frozen, but, um, sushi grade supposedly has been frozen for longer and has more um, stringent quality control than just the other fish that enters, you know, the food supply. So yeah, the NHS says, you know, as long as it's from a reputable establishment, sushi grade fish is fine. Wow. Um, the U.S. Everybody's all concerned. I will tell you, I had sushi both of my pregnancies. <laughs> um, I, I made my own ceviche with, you know, fresh caught salmon in my first pregnancy. Yeah. So. Um, and like cooked fish was off putting. The smell of it was like, whoa. But raw fish, you know, it just smells like the ocean. It was yeah. like very, very delicious to me. So whoa. I did not avoid sushi. Um, the other ones, you know, you got the eggs with runny yolks, the um, deli meats, the soft cheese. So the relative rates of you getting sick from those foods or those being contaminated are really low. So with eggs with runny yolks, the concern is salmonella. The chances that an egg in the U.S. is contaminated with with salmonella is anywhere from 1 in 12,000 to 1 in 30,000 eggs. And overall, you look at all the foodborne illness outbreaks in the U.S., fewer than 2% are from eggs. Okay. Mm. Almost half of them are from raw fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Nobody tells you to avoid raw fruits and vegetables. There's this documentary <laughs> now on Netflix. I think is it called Poisoned or something like that. And it, it'll yeah. you'll never eat romaine lettuce again after watching yeah. it. It's like, I mean, I don't change my diet after watching any documentary, but I'm just saying that it's <laughs> probably like, a good choice. Yeah, but I'm just saying yeah. that it 
yeah, what it shows you is that like romaine is like it's like the the biggest risks come from yeah, as you mentioned, eating vegetables vegetables and it's interesting when i'll post about food safety stuff um i'll get people from all over the world dming me what what goes on in their country and uh avoiding salad and like pre-cut vegetables or pre-cut fruit is the recommendation that they often get Hmm. so they're like oh my doctor told me to stay away from salad which actually makes a lot of sense with all the outbreaks on romaine lettuce if 46 percent of our food illness outbreaks in the u.s are coming from fresh produce, then uh, that would be the one that I would be most cautious about, like how fresh it is. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, And personally, anything that is pre-cut up, pre-chopped, unless it's something you're going to cook, those are the ones that are most highly contaminated. Um, Restaurant food is another thing. Like you look at the rates of illness caused by things prepared at restaurants or pre-made meals sold in grocery stores versus homemade meals. Most of them are the things that are prepared in restaurants or commissary kitchens. So the more food you prepare yourself, the better. The Hmm. more produce you're washing yourself and cutting up yourself and, you know, making sure that none of the lettuce is like rotten before you eat it. (laughs) You know, those would be really smart things to do. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're removing eggs from the menu for fear of of contamination, I mean, as we talked about, yes, um, that's a that could be a big mistake. I mean, considering the nu- the nutrient density of eggs, yes, absolutely, super interesting. What do you think about? I mean, you see these. I know people in my personal life who I'm close friends with. But I would never procreate with because they have these very strict diets. You know, I'm friends with vegans, vegetarians. What what are your thoughts on having like like because as you mentioned, as we talked about earlier, there is this push towards you know uh, at the population level adopting more plant based diets, right? And and there are a lot of vegans and vegetarians out there that are having children. Yeah. And I caught flack because I've said on the podcast many times and I own it. I'm this is how I feel. I would not want to procreate with a vegan, somebody who had like a really strict di- vegan diet. Yeah. I just wouldn't if I had the choice, you know. Um, we're co-creating this child together and I feel like it's like the strictest most fringe, you know, diet out there and maybe you can kind of pull some levers to make it work for body composition and the like, but I don't think it, it's in any way optimal from the standpoint of procreation. So what do you, I mean, as a, as a dietitian, how do you kind of approach that? Yeah, the, it's a tricky one. Um, you know, I've been vegetarian before and I have some loved ones that are vegan and continue to be vegan. So, and I understand all of the arguments for and against deeply, deeply. Um, my, my opinion is really formed not by um, morality, um, environmental concerns, ethics of hurting animals or something. Um, mine is solely on like what what is required for a baby to develop optimally. Let's like reverse engineer what's an optimal prenatal diet from that standpoint and then see where we end up. And ultimately, at least if you're incorporating new research into your (laughs) analysis, you end up with a diet that is at the very least omnivorous, Um, at least contains eggs and dairy. I would argue that seafood is also necessary, some type of like flesh food. Otherwise, you're not going to get really, you're going to get some glycine, but very little glycine. Um, So you talk about that collagen component. You cannot build collagen if you don't have the building blocks for collagen, Mm. which includes uh, glycine, which is in very small proportions in in plant foods, and proline, again, in very small proportions in plant foods. Um, So you do need some type of of flesh. That is my um, opinion on it. So I think a pescatarian can do it. It does get tricky. The more limitations you have in your diet, the more places you potentially introduce possible nutrient deficiencies. So there's considerations with the concentrations of nutrients, the forms of nutrients that are in the food, like is it as bioavailable? Iron and zinc, for example, are less bioavailable. Um, 
is it in the form that the body, if it has to convert it to another form, can it do it in sufficient amounts? So if you're eating no animal foods whatsoever and your only form of vitamin A you're getting is beta carotene, can you convert enough of that into vitamin A to not be deficient? Maybe a very small fraction of the po population may be able to if they have the genetics for it, but many of us do not have the genes to convert enough beta carotene into vitamin A. Um, omega-3 is another consideration. You know, people just think omega-3s are omega-3s, but it's, it's an umbrella term for several different types of fatty acids. And the forms of omega-3s that you get from plants does not convert readily into EPA and DHA in sufficient concentrations. It's like one to three percent gets mm. converted. Um, so they've even they've even done studies on the omega three part in um, lactating women because you can measure the level of uh, different nutrients in the breast milk. You supplement these women with flaxseed oil to try to boost the DHA content of the breast milk. Flax seeds don't contain any DHA, but they're like, well, they'll be able to convert some, right? No, doesn't change the DHA levels in the breast milk. Wow, so flax seed supplementation <laughs> for lactating women doesn't doesn't alter Will DHA levels. Will not change the DHA levels. You have to have certain things preformed. Wow. And those long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, you do. There is a vegan source, but it's specifically algae-based DHA supplements. So they grow a type of algae under very specific conditions to optimize the amount of EPA and DHA and then concentrate it into supplemental form. That is an option for, for vegans, but that is the only way they would get any DHA. Wow. So there's just a lot of considerations. I could go on for a long time and actually I'm working on my third book and there will be a whole chapter on considerations with uh, vegetarians because hmm. there's a lot there's just a lot to it I tend to hit it from the micronutrient standpoint but when you start looking at macronutrient balance um, the amino acid balance uh, the fatty acid balance usually on those those diets you're getting a really high amount of, of omega-6 fats which can be problematic you know yeah um... I mean, the the conversation surrounding industrially ref refined seed oils tends to kind of um, be focused on cardiovascular disease health outcomes. It's like do that that conversation is dominated by cardiovascular risk, right? But yep. there was a paper um, published by Taha from UC Davis, I believe, and it was a review looking at the headline of the article, the title of the article was like linoleic acid, good or bad for the brain. I don't know if you saw it, but it was a great mm -hmm. little review. Yeah. And it talks about the fact that, and you know, I'd love to have you speak to this, that um, women who consume more higher levels of linoleic acid, mm -hmm. right? Higher levels of omega-6 dominant linoleic acid. Yep. There's higher levels of linoleic acid in breast milk as a result, yep. I believe. I could be you know, yes, mischaracterizing this. but it, And it also seems to have an impact on the cognitive development of their offspring. Yes. So your omega-3s and omega-6 fats are, are really very similar in their structure. It's just where the double bonds are and the number, number of double bonds. Um, and so if there is an excess of omega-6 and a lack of omega-3 coming in the diet, which is pretty much almost universal, <laughs> even if you're trying really hard, that's pretty much universal, um, you can have omega-6s taking the place of omega-3s but they don't function exactly the same because they're slightly different in their structure. So they don't signal exactly the same molecules and respond exactly the same to neurotransmitters. Um, so that's why you run into issues. And if you look historically, again, I like to kind of zoom out and look at, okay, like how do we get here? What's going on with our diets? Um, we didn't have seed, seed oils weren't a thing. Okay, like think about how you get um, butter. You milk the cow, the cream rises to the top, you separate off the cream, you churn it into butter, boom, there's butter. How do you get lard and tallow? You harvest an animal, you take all the fat, you like cook it down in a pot, you strain it, you have lard and tallow. And like, if you've ever, again, if anyone's ever had an animal share, like if you 
ask for the fat and they give you all of it, you will have enough fat for like years from a single animal. <laughs> That's why they used it to make candles and other things. There's like no possible way that you could consume all of it, right? But these are like tangible ways that you get, you know, oils out of things. Um, olives, they're so greasy. You can like squeeze them and the oil comes out. But how do you get oil out of corn? <laughs> Have you tried to like squeeze a corn cob and get oil out of it? You know, like... It's not it, gonna be easy. <laughs> it takes a lot of industrial... Like we needed the industrial revolution to even make seed oils a possibility in the diet beyond the like tiniest proportions that some artisan is doing by mashing up, you know, uh, sunflower seeds or huh. something, right? Um, but you need just a ton of equipment to get it done and you need this mass scale farming because it takes a lot of corn to get a very small amount of oil. Corn is mostly starch, mm. you know? Um, so we are just consuming a massive uh, excess of this type of fat relative to what we consumed traditionally. Um, my big concern with it actually is how it affects your like your metabolism and how stable the oil is or not. So you look at saturated fats, they're very stable. You cook them and you look at their structure and it's pretty much unchanged. There's no double bonds in saturated fats. They can't get oxidized and uh, release all sorts of free radicals when you're frying them at high temperatures. So if you're frying in tallow and coconut oil and palm oil, like traditional saturated fats that were used for frying, the oil is pretty much unchanged from start to finish. You fry with an omega-6 fat and you create all sorts of toxic compounds because there's multiple places on that fatty acid chain where they can get damaged and they form all sorts they call them um, lipid oxidation products or LOPs and there's all sorts of data on LOPs now and how how just awful they are for levels of inflammation in our body they're you know just rough on our mitochondria so if you want to have a well-functioning metabolism you probably don't want to have a whole bunch of seed oils coming in um yeah I think it's I think people can get so extreme that like, oh, I won't touch anything that has like a drop of seed oils and I won't eat at a restaurant and I won't eat a steak if they oiled the grill with seed oils. I don't take it to that level. Um, but in the areas that I can control where it's going to be like a pretty large amount of fat coming in, like mayonnaise, for mm. example, or salad dressing or any kind of cooking oil I do, I use, I just, I don't. Seed oils are not in the house in those things. Occasionally they'll sneak in with some like corn chips or something. <laughs> and I don't freak out about like a restaurant meal or whatever. I'm not going to like hound the chef over what oils they're using. But I'm also probably not going to order like the deep fried entree. You yeah. know what I mean? Amen. I couldn't Unless agree it's more. like really worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like really, really good fries or something. I love <clears throat> I love your candor and how practical your the the what you just shared is. But you have to realize that among your peers, I mean, this is a very controversial topic today. Because every oh, yeah. today, today yeah. the roll. Did you see the Rolling Stone article that just came out? <laughs> How it's now yeah. essentially racist to right. <laughs> to av to avoid seed oils. Yeah, I mean, they didn't say they didn't go as far as to say that it was racist. To be to be fair, it was like you're, it's now a right wing obsession, right? Which is just crazy. And it cited experts, Harvard pedigree experts that. In the article, are like, well, it's it's this is like overhyped. It's no big deal. Yeah, yeah. You're you're losing sight of the forest for the trees, which maybe to some de degree is true, as you as you kind of mentioned, like people who yeah. are like obsessed and and yeah. you know hyper focusing on that one yeah. aspect of ultra processed foods as opposed to the whole picture. But I do think that it's it is just as much pseudoscience to say that there's no concern whatsoever with Absolutely. them as it is to say that they are the sole smoking gun with all of our health ills. I. Certainly agree. And the thing is, you know, from my like dietetics background, we were just like hammered into our head, heart healthy, unsaturated fats, heart healthy, unsaturated fats, which uh, is not exactly a correct message. Um, and ultimately, I just think we are already, if even if you took all the seed oils out of your diet, you're already going to be getting plenty of omega-6 fats so just tell me 
tell me why we need more. We need, we really don't need more than like a few grams of polyunsaturated fat coming in a day. Yeah. Um, but you, we're getting, you know, many more times that amount. I can't even quote a number, but it's, it's a lot. And the more processed foods, the more fried foods coming in, the more they're just adding up. Um, even worse when it's like people cooking at home and they're, you know, cook, baking with canola oil or frying their uh, enchilada tortillas in giant vat of mazzola corn oil. You know, I'm just like, oh, man, <laughs> we really shouldn't be doing this. But, yeah, I would be all for it if they were frying it in lard or tallow or coconut oil. I, hmm. I, I'd be down. But, uh, yeah, once you're once they're heated to high temperatures... They're just like such an inflammatory disaster, which is, of course, how most of them are are processed and used. Yeah, as, especially in the re- in the restaurant setting in the fryer setting. I have uh, I was on I was getting dinner at a rotisserie chicken place, and I put I caught a photo of the um, like the fryer where they were frying falafel, and it was like a falafel spot too. And uh, I put it on my Instagram and I asked, I polled my audience because I've never worked in a restaurant. I was like, how often do you think these things are changed? And my follower, you know, many, some, many of my followers have restaurant experience. And were like, well, there are regulations, but in, in reality, like they're often not changed for days, if not weeks. They're just kept at temperature. And, you know, they'll maybe, they'll maybe strain some of the debris, right? Right. Like yeah. out of the fryer, but that yeah. oil is just kept at temperature making it like a really potent who knows what i mean yeah not not good full of all all sorts of carcinogens yeah 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 what about um the post-pregnancy setting lactation foods to optimize or encourage better output yeah so i actually don't really subscribe to the idea that you require specific foods to increase the the quantity of breast milk that you produce. Um, There are some foods and herbs and supplements and things that can do that a little bit. They're called galactagogues, Um, you know, oatmeal and brewer's yeast and fennel and there's galactagogues. They're called galactagogues. Sounds like some Marvel like, (laughs) like, Galact, what Galactic was the, yeah, what was the, um, yeah, like some like super enemy or something. Yeah. World eater. Yeah. So, so not, th- they, not very so effective. They, they can, for some people, make a really big difference. Um, for me, I mean, I've, I've nursed two kids into toddlerhood and I, I never really used much of them, I guess. Certainly mm. didn't eat oatmeal because that's a massive blood sugar disaster for me personally. Um, and I feel like garbage when I eat oatmeal, so I don't didn't do that. I think the biggest thing is is oatmeal one of these foods that's considered by many to be a galactagog? Yes, yes, yes. And some people take it in like a supplement form. Huh? Milky oats. They'll get like the tops of the oats, and it's made into a tincture. And oh yeah, there's all sorts of them. What Moringa, aspect of oats? There's like a ton. Interesting. I am not sure what the constituent in oats is that's responsible huh. for that function. Um, yeah, but anyways, um, you know, the, the biggest thing with milk production is making sure you're eating enough, drinking enough, and that includes getting enough minerals, so getting enough electrolytes. And then a lot of it really has to do with how much time you are spending with your baby, skin to skin, and whether you're letting them nurse whenever they want or if you're trying to withhold and stick to a schedule. In an ideal world, they nurse whenever they want. Um, And then is baby latching properly? Is there anything that's restricting their ability to latch? And these are things to like work with your lactation consultant on. But, you know, people eating all sorts of different diets, um, super highly nutrient dense, you know, really poor, poor nutrient uh, diets still can produce plenty of breast milk. Um, What can change is the concentration of certain micronutrients. And this is a highly, highly controversial area. Um, 
I actually have like a two hour professional level webinar going through like micronutrient by micronutrient, which ones are affected by maternal intake and nutrient status and which ones aren't because hmm. some are, some aren't. You mentioned linoleic acid or, um, or your omega sixes being affected in breast milk. This is true. Um, same thing on the flip side for DHA. The more DHA you consume, the more there is in breast milk. Um, choline, B12, almost all the B vitamins hold folate. Um, many of your minerals, iodine being one of the most important ones, um, those levels in breast milk highly reflect whether a mother has sufficient levels herself or if she's consuming enough on a regular basis. Wow. Yeah. So just continue to eat nutrient dense diet. Yes, absolutely. Throughout the process. Yes. And you don't need to make it complicated. It's the same things you were emphasizing in pregnancy. Emphasize those same things postpartum, but you need more of it. So your nutrient demands postpartum are actually higher than during pregnancy. The protein requirements, there was finally a study. They tested women at uh, three to six months postpartum and their protein requirements were at the level of or beyond the level of a typical female athlete. Whoa. This is at three to six months postpartum. A female athlete? Yes. Damn. Yeah, like 1.9 grams per kilo of mm. protein. And this is at the time for anyone who's had a baby, you've gone through most of your significant recovery in the first three months. You've like healed from birth, you've established lactation if you're nursing and still three to six months out this was in breastfeeding women though um, their protein demands were really really high wow but um, caloric demands way higher um, so if you're just focusing on more food specifically emphasizing your protein rich foods you're probably going to be in a good place hmm. because your protein rich foods are rich in most of the micronutrients that you're worried about um, and I do also recommend continuing on your prenatal supplement uh, postpartum as well. It's, hmm. yeah. What about, I mean, I feel like women today, and I have no idea what it's like to experience the body pressure that women experience, but like you see on social media that these celebrities will have a baby and then within like weeks, seemingly, they're back to their bikini bodies. Yeah. Has that kind of pressure affected women and oh, yeah. you know, is it playing a role in the fact that, you know, as soon as women give birth these days, maybe, I don't know, but maybe they're, they're, they're going back to these like super restrictive diets to, to way earlier than they should be trying to regain that, that pre baby yeah. body. Absolutely. Yeah. There's huge pressure. Um, and while some people do, uh, their, their body returns to a similar size fairly quickly, not everybody does. I would say those women are probably the exception. Um, it also depends on like what number of baby you're on because after you know your first pregnancy, uh, your body goes back a little bit quicker than after your next pregnancy. At least that was my experience. Um, but I was actually really, um, I actually welcomed a slower return to my like usual body weight after my second baby because I felt strong and nourished. I really just focused on recovery so much more. I mean, mm. your body is going through a lot. Like the hormonal shift from pregnancy to lactation is the most extreme that a woman will ever experience in her entire life. It's, it's absolutely insane. And not only is, do you have all these hormones of lactation, but like your thyroid completely remodels postpartum as well, because your thyroid had to do a heck of a lot of work during pregnancy. Like you have to pump out 50% more thyroid hormone Whoa. for your whole pregnancy. Um, so your thyroid has to like reestablish its you know normal pace. You're now caring for a human being 24 seven including at night, your sleep is very disrupted for a very long time and it just is what it is. Um, and your body, if you're nursing, you're also producing breast milk, which is, you know, that takes about 500 calories a day just to produce breast milk. I mean, it's wow. a lot of work. There's a lot happening. So I think, unfortunately, the sort of like awe and wonder at like, wow, I can't believe all these things are happening and my body is doing this and I grew this human being and this is, this is just a miracle um, that is like not acknowledged. And instead it's like, try to get your body back. You know, it's like, what? I just had a baby. 
<laughs> so what are you talking about? Um, so I liked, I like the adage nine months on, nine months off, like give yourself some time. Some women too, it, it takes them longer than nine months to lose the weight they gain during pregnancy. Sometimes just with how crazy lactation hormones are, sometimes it's like those last five or 10 pounds don't come off until uh, baby eventually weans, you mm. know? And, and that's, that sometimes is just the reality of it, which is also okay, in my opinion. Um, so I think we need to do a better job of preparing mothers for, yeah, just how wild postpartum recovery is, the importance of nour nourishing yourself well. I mean, you nourish yourself well, you're gonna be stronger, your thyroid's gonna be happier. When it is time, the weight will come off easier if you're eating enough to support your metabolism. I mean, if you're under eating, your already very busy thyroid is gonna have a really hard time um, picking up the pace later on. You're gonna set yourself up for hypothyroidism if you're not eating enough, wow. which ultimately is gonna be a big challenge with weight loss down the line. Um, so if we can nourish ourselves better, especially in those like first six months or so, um, you're gonna reap the benefits long-term. I mean, you wanna have like energy to spend time with your baby. And when you're working on very little sleep, at least like, feed yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, but easier said than done. You need a village. You need people to come and like bring you food. You can't really be up on your feet like cooking for a while. Your life is now perpetually interrupted by a baby. So traditional cultures got it. There was like a six week period where somebody would cook for you, oftentimes live in your house or you'd live in their house, like a, an auntie, your mom, your mother-in-law and you would have like everything taken care of, all the housework, everything done for you for like six weeks. Yeah, and we're like, good luck, I'll come <laughs> over to hold the baby. <laughs> it's like, that's not helpful. It's crazy. Bring me a meal. That's one yeah. of the reasons why they think I, that we live so long as a species, right? It's like the grandma, grandmother oh, hypothesis, yeah. right? Yeah. Something about how like our grandparent, like raising a baby is so time intensive. And yes. so uh, resource intensive that it's like we decided to keep our species around longer than just procreation, than just yeah. the time it would take to procreate so that our grandparents, so that we could have grandparents. That makes sense. Watch out for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have no idea. It's a theory, but. Yeah. Well, so many of my followers were like, Lily is the goat. Super excited to listen to this conversation. And now I see why. You, oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You're amazing. Thanks for coming in. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.